This is our first uh, energy uh, candidate visiting here, is, uh, Carlos Guardiola, and he is from uh, Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. Yes, I can. Uh, and uh, his uh, background is a very strong uh, background in re engine research for many years. He's an associate professor there. And uh, most recently, uh, he did a Fulbright scholarship here at the University of Michigan. And uh, it was through that uh, Fulbright that he learned about the work that we do here uh, through uh, some professors at the University of Michigan. They encouraged him to apply for this, uh, uh, for this job and came over. So, um, Thank you very much. So, well, uh, today's topic is about the charge estimation inside the in cylinder, sorry, in the cylinder of internal combustion engine. But before going to the techniques, let me talk a little about me and the things I, I do. So this is me, it's exactly the same type, so that's easy. <laughs> I teach in the in the Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. It's the same blue sky as Colorado, but we have farms and 20 degrees Celsius, so it's good weather year round. And, uh, okay, I'm manager of the engine control research in a big institute that is CMT Motor Thermicos, and we are, let's say, 40 faculty working on internal combustion engines. So it's like a big department, but the mechanical engineering department here, but only for uh, engines. So okay, just to, to put here some keywords of my life, I started as undergraduate student in, I think in 98, I, I, I went to the institute saying I want to teach here. So I started doing some research and I started, my background was, or initial work was in turbo charging, energy modeling, one dimensional model. Uh, well, then I graduated, and well, one nice thing for me, I got the highest record, that's a record for, for the school, and the history of the school, and I get a national award, and with that it was very easy to get an assistant professor just without the PhD, right, in the, in the university. Well, it's a different system in Spain, so, so it could be like a, it's an assistant, but they have some responsibility in Moses. And I was involved in a big European project with the industry, there was Wastor there, and also Daimler Chrysler, at the time of Daimler Chrysler. And I need to do a lot of engine fiber detection and uh, identification, and also control. And I complement my mechanical background with some research state at, state at uh, Ohio State University. So the thing is that I moved from... Is that the Sorry? Is that the Georgia? Yeah, the Georgia. The Georgia. The professor of sorry. sorry. <laughs> So uh, that means that I changed my mind and starting from internal combustion engine, I decided to move to, to controls. And I'm the guy doing controls in my department. So while well, I get the training in 2003, then the PhD in 2005, and following that, I get promoted to associate professor. Well, so just getting a couple of words, yeah. so letters, but you can get it. And uh, while there is a small group, there's another faculty and me, and let's say five PhD students and master students that could be from five to ten, depending on the moment. And this is more or less the, the, the size. We also have access to the facilities today. We are working for dinos in the, in the lab. So we have technicians for doing that. But this is, let's say, this is common from the, from the institute, and we get access to that depending on the projects we have. But we have a lot of projects. So I repeat another uh, research study at Ohio State, and starting from 2011, I, I had a lot of involvement with the International Federation of Automatic Control, and I got involved in many, in many different conferences. And one of the things I like is that I become editor of a book called Automotive Model Electric Control, that is quite, it's a best-selling book in the, in the game. And, uh, well, I learned Next thing for me, I was able to get one Ralph Hart Teacher Education Award but for being in Spanish, and the Spanish University is quite hard to get, so I'm happy with that. And a full grade scholar in last year in the University of Russia. So other things, I'm, I'm in the editorial board of a couple of journals, and these are the keywords. We will talk a little about this. It's engine controls, fiber detection identification, onboard diagnosis, modeling, Identification, model detection, control, a lot of diesel and mostly automotive, but I'm open to more from more part of the world. 
So some performance metrics, I'm sure that the, the department head would like this. Uh, teaching metrics, I'm the top 1% faculty of UPD. We are 3,000 faculty, so it's, it's the top 1%. And research metrics, I would say over 30% of full professor and over 200% of associate professor because there are associate professors that they don't work as they should. That's excessive. And I get the certification for going to full professor in the process of game. And also, what you can study that, many journal papers and conferences and so on. So let's talk a little about the research we're doing, the general framework. And one thing is that the things have changed, well, I would say, in terms of masculinity or energy. I like this a lot. This is from 1920s. This is propaganda for the, uh, for the Soviet, Soviet Union and says, well, I don't know Russia, but the translation is the smoke of chimneys is the breath of Soviet Russia. <laughs> so things have changed a lot. That's clear. <laughs> if you take, a, if you go to Hollywood movies of the, of the beginning of the 20th century, you get the same. You get energy, things burning, moving things, things like that. And that's the feeling of the, let's say, the first half of the 20th century. And then we are ready to write to this. Well, someone could think this is Beijing, but this is Paris. So the, the interview was, was there, was hidden by the smoke. This was two years ago in summer, and now we have problems in Boston Madrid, so many cities are polluted. And for sure, we also have blowout problems. So this is the anomalies in the temperature. This is data from 2014. And you can see a lot of regions in red. This records the highest temperature in the, in the history of the, of the metrics we have, of the rest of the metrics. So it's clear that things are changing. So what happens with the engine control, or with the engine? Uh, I will start just talking or focus a little in automotive, but I think it's, uh, it's quite parallel to power generation. We have a stricter regulation framework. So limits, emission limits are lower. We need to increase OBD. That means that we need to detect failures. It's not only designed with engines, but the engine needs to operate like this on the, on the slide. And uh, we are starting to integrate new testing met methods. So RDFD is real <coughs> emissions. So we need to not only test and lab the engine, but make sure that the engine is behavior, behaving and it should behave on the road. Well, for sure, you want to have a, an efficient, cheap, and very fun car or a robust power plant. And also, we have different good qualities, and we have a very demanding market for, for what? Of course, things in time to market. How, how they use the responsibilities with new technologies. And if you go to the recent years, there's, well, I think there's a technological chaos. If you are, sorry, I will talk about uh, European regulations, Euro 5 would be, I think, tier 2, tier 3. Uh, if you go to a Euro 5 engine, you know how is the engine. All the engines are exactly the same from the different manufacturers. You move to the Euro 6, the engine today, and every manufacturer has a different solution. That's a technological curse. And we have, let's say, multiple concepts. We start talking about new combustion modes, New boosting systems, sequential, uh, uh, supercharged, turbocharged. We have EGR, exogram circulation, high pressure, low pressure. Well, a lot of different uh, of, of different technologies, and also we talk about power chains that combine an internal combustion engine and different things or distributed power systems. Where is the control? The control is everywhere, because for many of these technologies, the control is an enabling, enabling technology. Well, that means that without control, you cannot have an advanced boosting system and high pressure, low pressure EGR. You need to make it run. And also, if you change the control, you change the performance and emissions. And this is in the United States now. Like, <coughs> well, this is from a German uh, newspaper, and it's talking about how diesel Volkswagen is, well, really stupid, sorry, uh, because of the control, because you can check the behavior of the engine just changing the control. If you just move into that, well, the software today is very complex. It's, we have a lot of megabytes of, of, of software. If you take the documentation from the uh, uh, today's ECU, uh, an engine controller, 
to be like a 10,000 book. So it's like a Windows documentation. It's exactly the same. And calibration is a bottleneck in the development process. Once you have finished the engine and you have all the controller set, you need to decide what to put in each one of the numerical parameters of the, of the controller. And this could be like several hundreds of thousands of parameters inside the, the, the controller. So someone needs to do that. Well, it seems complicated, but I think it's really nice because we have the new technologies, but we have new methods and models. We have things that 10 years ago was not possible. We have model predictive control. If we are able to have a model, we can control very well the engine. We are able to adapt models and adapt systems to the behavior of, of the real behavior of the engine. And we have real-time capabilities for single processing and for computing. And additionally, we have a lot of information. So sensors are, let's say, quite cheap. Well, this is something that OEM would discuss. But uh, NOx sensor is like $50. Just compare an NOx sensor with a gas analyzer we have in the lab. A gas analyzer in the lab is like 50000 And with $50, you have something similar. We have oxygen sensor, GPS, particulate matter, in cylinder pressure sensor, that would be the one I will be talking. And there is a lot of communication that could be used vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, to the city, and the city to the vehicle. So this is something that we can use and will be used in the near future. So I must say that it's a very exciting moment for research in the future. And my research is about combining different technologies with new methods and new information. So as you may see, and after 15 years of, of working in the control, I don't have, let's say, an only uh, a clear research line, but I have done many different works just working in this frame. So just to provide a list of, of some of the words, PGR digit control, so how to coordinate the control of the tool searching and the exosgas recirculation, that is a complex control. Detecting search in turbo compressors in the, in the engine. Well, this was my PhD, was, or started in my PhD, was detecting differences in the fuel in the different cylinders and how to correct this real time, to be able to detect exactly what are you having in the different cylinders. And in the control, sensor and model data fusion, that's combining a sensor that is very accurate but slow with a model that can be very fast but is not accurate. So we can fuse the information and go to a, to a better information of the system. A hybrid electrical vehicle, and optimal control of high pressure and low pressure EGR. We have several EGR groups, we can combine them in a, in a let's say, optimal way. And these are, let's say, the four works I'm doing today. These are open researches. And one is on diagnostics and control of after treatment. I'm working on diesel oxidation catalyst and now moving to DPF, to diesel particulate filter and three way catalyst. NOx modeling, that is always a hot topic for the SCR. Emission control of real guide in the environment, how to close to control the emissions for being sure that we don't have more emissions than we should have. And finally, applications of the incident pressure sensor, mostly for the estimation of the quantity of air inside the sensor. And that's the selected topic for today. And uh, we pass to the Okay, so let me say that this is mostly the work, well, I'm working there, but the PhD student, that is the, the guy that is spending all the hours with the night for doing this, is Paul Vares, and that there are many contributors from my university, Benjamin Plan, Roberto Provence, Jaime Martin, and also people from the University of Michigan. Mostly Basilis, Pianto Poulos, and others, Stefano Poulos, that they are in Greece, as you can see, and work there. And I'm sure I'm missing some, someone, but you have a, well, whenever there's something published, you will get the publication on, on the bottom, and you can check there, the, the author. The, the so let's talk about insulin pressure measurement. Well, if you are into engine research, you know insulin pressure. It has been from, I think, from the first words of diesel, of, of, of Mr. Diesel, has been the, the key tool. 
So at the beginning, it was measured in a very mechanical way, and, and we use this for everything, for knowing the indicative pressure, the mean indicative pressure, for doing combustion di diagnostics, peak pressure for design, the timing of the combustion CF50, and also for detecting knock in the engine. I think you, you work a lot of this. But today, there is a revival on application of insulin the pressure because we have, for the first time, production of really, really very cheap sensors. So this, for example, these two on the top are from Continental. This is with this glow plug integrated. That's without the glow plug. And this is from Paul Warner. And this on production would be for the OEM, let's say, between 20 and 40 US dollars, depending on the option. If you compare that with a standard sensor from Kistler with an amplifier that would be like $10,000, a little less than that, you can see what's the difference in the scale. And well, I am not showing results, but this sensor up to 20 kilohertz is mostly identical to this one. So it has a very good response. I will not compare today, but if someone is interested in that, I'm really in love with, with so this kind of sensor. The one that you said that These two are continental, continental. And this is this is Paul Warner Bellu. Yes, Bellu is the French uh, brand of Paul Warner, but today it's Paul Warner. And also, Delphi has some versions, so everyone is doing something like this. But this, well, you can get in after sales because they are in some engines for 200 US dollars. So the only problem is the is the size you have for for installing it. But if you can put it, it's, it's cheap, <laughs> it's, it's free. So what what can you do with ICTS? You can do global control and monitor and diagnose the capacitor. Clear. And there are a lot of people working on that, and also us are doing things on that, CA50 control, just centering the combustion in the place you want, controlling the torque, and even you can go to fancy things like controlling what's the duration of the combustion, just changing the EGR so you change the ocean application. But as I think this is quite a straightforward, and everyone is working on this, I will talk a little about this case. Is how to go to the estimation of the air inside the cylinder only with this sensor. And if we have time, I don't know if we will have, we will do uh, some few words on how to integrate that in NOx model. So this is our pressure case from our real engine. We have the combustion, the compression, combustion. Here we have a lot of noise, and then we have expansion. This is a RCCI engine, reactivity control engine. So what you are doing is compressing air and gas line, you inject this cell, and with that you do a small combustion and you create afterwards to trigger the combustion of the of the mix. So what we want to, to know is what's the quantity of air or air plus fuel that we have inside the cylinder. So there are many things we, that we can do. For example, one of the things that you can do is just look to the compression, and even I, I did some work on this, and you can get to a thermodynamic relationship where you can relate the mass with the pressure increase here. But it has a lot of problems, because for doing that, you need to know what's the temperature, and what's the polytropic coefficient, and that means that you finish doing a, a correlation for the temperature, and that at the end is like doing a correlation of, for the for the pressure efficiency for the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So I will not say it's useless, but it's similar to have just say a, an empty model. You are not measuring what's the master. So let's say that this approach has mm, some application, but it's not the the, the prime thing. So let's take to do another thing, and the other thing is just looking into this part here. If we go there and we do a zoom, what we get is something like this. This is an RCCI engine, so we have a very fast combustion. So we have the combustion, we have the pressure rise, and here we can see that there is like a pressure oscillation. Usually what do we do with that? Well, we just remove that. But let's analyze this. Well, here you have the Fourier transform of this signal here, like minus 70, just before 
the combustion, during the compression, and then the same with the window in 20 degrees just here. And we are analyzing the spectrum of the two. So what we can see is that effectively, we have the pressure level that has increased. The third one, the, the upper one, is the one with the combustion. We have all the frequency content of the combustion. We have a lot of sensor noise here. But this is a special thing. It's not noise. It's just a very definite tip that goes with this. And this has a physical meaning. It's something physical. You can do minutes of time, and it's always similar. It's always the same. What's that? Uh, sorry, I will say that it was usually what you do is always say, oh, something happened there. I need to remove that. And either you integrate for saying there is knock. I have a knock or ring intensity that we call instead of knock in the case of this kind of engines. Or you filter because if you try to do the combustion diagnosis and get the heat release, as in the heat release you are doing the derivative of the pressure, well, it makes the heat release to go up and down. Say, so, oh, this makes some sense. I don't want that. Let's take a look at that. What, what are we having there? Pressure waves. There are pressure waves going from the combustion chamber from one part to the other. They will have a combination of different modes of the pressure. So if you, well, if you talk with the professor from vibrations, they would explain better than me. But at the end, what you have is several modes, pressure modes, that just create a composite wave that moves from, from one part of the combustion chamber to the other. And this is well known. The frequency is related with the speed of sound and with the resonant mode we are studying. So the, there are resonant modes that go with the diameter, with the ball, and other that will go with the head, we have a, at a given moment inside the cylinder. Furthermore, if you take the speed of sound, that's related with the gas properties and the temperature. Let's say with the bulk temperature, because at the end, if you see at the beginning of the combustion, you will have, like, let's say, hot pockets of gas and other parts with colder gas. But if you have the combustion here and you move to 20 degrees, it's perfectly mixed, or almost perfectly mixed, and you have, let's say, an average temperature in all the combustion chamber. You need that for, for doing a, a nice correlation. And, and with that, okay, the idea is there. If we measure the frequency, we can get the speed of sound, and with the speed of sound, we can get the temperature. So, another important thing is that uh, we have some modes that not, don't go in the circumference, that they go in the axial, in the, let's say, up and down, but as the height is very, very small, this goes to very high frequencies. And they also dissipate very, very fast, so we can just remove that. And with that, if we assume cylindrical geometry, well, this was studied in, in 1938, we can know what's the basic coefficient that relates the frequency with the speed of sound for each one of these modes. And this is the first one, the second, and the third. Well, the first coefficient is 1.84. So let's take a look again. Let's take the signal, and now we are moving to, let's say, hot things. This is Let's say time frequency. In fact, this is angle frequency, but it's, it's quite similar. We could discuss about that. And what we have done is just a tune between 2 kilohertz and 7 kilohertz. And we see that there is the frequency, this red color is just taking the frequency of this wave. And we can see that we pass from 5 kilohertz to <coughs> a little more than What's happening there? Why is it changing? Well, first thing is that we have an expansion. If we have an expansion, the temperature goes down, so that's frequency. So this is the, the first thing. And if you go to many words in the video, they say that this is the only thing. But it's not the only thing. Here we have the same spectrum, but from 2 kilohertz to 12. And we have calculated by hand it was the first mode, is the black line, blue and green for the for that cylinder, that infinite cylinder. And hmm, 
It's, it's interesting because here we can see that it's very related, it's very near, of the, of the, this is the real behavior, the red light, the, or the red region of, of the spectrum. So here I see that the black line is, is just on this red mark, but here we can see that there is a lot of difference. So what's happening there? Is the cylinder similar to an infinite cylinder where, where we are near the top left center? Of course not. Because in this case, we have a bowl, and we are moving from this bowl to something that is not cylindrical, that has a specific shape. So when we approach the top left center, it's no longer behaving as a cylinder. It's behaving some, as something different. So if you go through the literature, well, there are some CFT words for, for detecting that, but has been done for a fixed position of the, of the system, and it's just for detecting the noise quality depending on this design of the, of, the, of the combustion chamber. But we want to move in another direction. What we want to do is to be able to know what's the best coefficient depending on the position of the piston. And just take a look at that. Depending on the position, you know exactly the geometry. So it should be possible to know for that given engine what's the best coefficient. Well, going to the traffic is, is a little more complicated. This is, well, we have a complete uh, publication on this. And there are many approaches you can use. The first thing, you can use open based approach. So you will just take the geometry and you use spin dynamic method for computing the resonant mode of the gas there. And with that, you are able for each one of the tank and the position, for each one of the positions of the, of the cylinder, for the piston, sir, uh, having was this, what well, is the, the black dots, and with that you are able to get what's the best coefficient. And what we can see is that the best coefficient, when we go far from the top of the center, goes to the cylindrical response. That is something that we should, it should happen. Other thing you could do is, is a database approach. You just measure all the pressure cases to analyze them, and then you say, okay, I know what's the mass because I'm measuring the mass and I have some residual gas fraction model. And with that, you just try to get that thing. So for the same engine, we did several thousand of cycles and we did this approach. And, and you can see that the experimental data plus minus the, 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 the confidence interval in three sigma is, let's say, very <coughs> near of the finite level. Well, when we approach the combustion, things start to be very strange because the temperature is not constant and we have a lot of incertitudes. But if we are 30 degrees onwards, everything goes well. And the last thing, if you don't have any information, you, you just take for several cycles with the, this, this basal coefficient and just say, okay, when you go here, the value should be that of the theory. And that works pretty well. So it's a good solution. One thing is that calibrating takes some time, but you have, once you have calibrated, it should be the same for, not for that cylinder, for all the cylinders of the engine, and for all the engines of the, of the same model. Well, for sure you have manufacturing discrepancies and, and precision in the sensors, but, but still the characterization should be similar. So, let's go to uh, the method overview, time frequency analysis, we just Take pressure, move the frequency, the average equation from frequency to a speed of sound. From the speed of sound, we move to temperature, and finally, from temperature to the perfect mass flow, we install the mass. And we can compact everything together, and these three steps put the mass as a function of the frequency. And one important thing is that still we have gamma, but the R disappears. That means that it's only sensitive to the gamma variation that is lower than the R variation. So still we need the properties, but it's something that, uh, let's say, is more robust than doing all the correlations one by one. So estimating the temperature is harder than estimating the mass. But uh, let me repeat this with the, with the thing now. Because for doing the Fourier transform, I need a window. 
So I'm putting here a window. With the window, I do the Fourier transform. This is the Fourier transform, and I get some peaks. And this, I say, OK, this seems to be the first regression mode. I combine with the engine characterization I did before, where I know what's the best coefficient for that position of the window. I have properties and volume, and I go to the gas state law, and with that, and the pressure, I get the mass. But one important thing is that I get the mass for one position of the window. But I can move the window, and I get the mass. Again, again, and again. So I get the mass as a function of the angle, and if I don't have low by, the mass should be mostly the same, well, exactly the same. So I could average, and I can get what's the mass, and if I do it well or not. So if the system is behaving well, or my method is detecting the mass in a right steady way. If I have problems applying the method, this standard deviation would be huge. Well, one other question we could have is, is it possible to do a direct method for passing from the pressure to the mass without all this? And the solution is yes. So here, instead of doing the Fourier transform, in the Fourier transform, what you are doing is just the integral of the signal with let's say a sinus or a cosinus, or a combined sinus and cosinus, I could do this, the integral of the signal, with the expected frequency as a function of the mass I have. So I put here the mass, I can get the frequency as a function of the mass, and I can just compute that. And that I can write in a quite compact way. So sorry, I think the details here are, are a little excessive, so, so we just look to the, to the paper if you're interested in. But the idea is that at the end, you can compute only this, that is a, a direct sum, you have a couple of sums, and you have a mass guess, and you compute this value. So I'm transforming this signal into something like this, where I'm varying mass, and I have some result of this, of this metric. And the peak of this is the mass we have inside the cylinder. And how can I know if, the, if this signal, if the method is behaving very well or not? Just comparing this peak with the rest of peaks. Of peaks. So if the signal is behaving very well according to my hypothesis, I would have a very sharp peak. But if not, I would have several peaks. In this case, the second peak is this one. So I can get a quality metric of this just comparing the two peaks. So with that, I know what's the mass. And if my signal, I can just in it or not. It's very straightforward. So method benefits. I'm using frequencies. 